Have a great session, guys. Will do. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, here we go. We have people filtering in. How's your week been, Lee? Pretty busy? Yeah, like, like every week post lockdown, I feel like um, 9 5 has disappeared and uh, there's no such thing as uh, Monday to Friday. <laughs> I, I quite like being able to say, do you know what? It's Tuesday. Yes, I will have a beer. I, I quite I quite like that, and I quite like the idea that I've got the freedom to say on a Tuesday morning, I'm not working this morning. Yeah. So uh, the freedom has afforded me a bit more of a psychological bump, and yeah, so my weeks feel busy, but I'm getting used to it. I think. Yeah, I think a lot of people have um, become quite, um, you know, keen on the current working arrangement just because of the amount of flexibility that it gives them. Hmm. I was talking to someone this morning about it, actually, that the, the idea that there are, there's a growing number of people who are saying things like, I told you we could do all of this from home and we don't need offices anymore. Uh, I'd like to ask that person how they feel after doing it for a year. Yeah. Um, but I do think that, you know, the general idea of returning to offices will be more about culture for an organization and, and creativity. Yeah. And no, I... sitting at a desk. I, I definitely think that offices will still be needed just because of in-person interaction, like you said. Like, mm. it, it's all good and well doing things over video. Like, it's great, but it just doesn't have that same dynamic. Nah. But yeah, definitely. Offices I mean, aren't gone, for sure. Like, I would love to give a hug to every one of the 50 people currently here. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Well, I think it looks like everybody's filtered through now. Um, so we'll, we'll get started. Um, hello everyone um, and welcome to NASFA's keynote of the conference, The Future of Fundraising, um, everything that you need to know. My name is Josh and I'm your call host today and just to confirm this session is being recorded so if you're not potential, uh, comfortable with potentially being in the recording you can leave now and access the session um, later on at another date. I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce you to Lee Clark, who's our keynote speaker from GivePenny. Just to give a bit of background on Lee, he's um, a basketball-loving, computer game-playing, proud husband and dad of two, and he's the chief um, executive officer of the digital fundraising platform, um, GivePenny. Um, and just to give a fun fact about Lee, he once warmed up a DJ set for Fatboy Slim, I'd be really interested to hear the story behind that because that sounds like quite an experience. Um, but yeah, so throughout the session, um, if you could please introduce yourselves in the chat box to let us know who you are and where you're coming from, that would be absolutely amazing. Um, and if you have any questions, please just put them in the Q&A box and I will do my best to get those questions over to Lee throughout the session um, and at the end as well. And if you would like to continue the conversation with us after the keynote is over, we will be going to the coffee shop and a link will be posted to that towards the end of the keynote presentation. Um, but without further ado, Lee, I'll let you take it away. Hi, everybody. 58 of you. Wow. What a privilege. I hope you're all OK um, and uh, staying safe, but trying to find some fun at the same time. Um, thanks to, uh, to everybody involved in, in asking me to, to take part in the conference. It, it's a, it's a privilege to be able to speak to you. So I'm hoping that you all get something from today. Um, if anything, uh, you can form your own opinion on what the future of fundraising is. Um, as, uh, as Josh pointed out, um, I'm the, uh, the CEO of GivePenny. Um, it stands for chief everything officer, um, because when you start anything new, you eventually start pointing in a direction and leading people through stuff. But for now, and hopefully um, from a, a work enrichment point of view, I get to do quite a lot of stuff every day and long may that continue. So yeah, Chief Everything Officer here at GivePenny. We're a fundraising platform that um, arguably we're a little bit early to the party with 
the idea of connecting stuff to fundraising challenges because it's more fun to do that way. I mean, we did this four years ago now. Um, and then lockdown happened and the world has changed for us as it has for charities and their attitudes to fundraising. So I'm going to talk about today sparks off ideas and I just wanted to say thanks to, to everybody for, for, for tuning in. Um, so let me just share my screen first of all. Let's rely a bit on technology for a second. Here we go. So hopefully you guys can see my screen. Um, what's the future of fundraising? So I think it's this. Uh, not, not a table lamp on the coast. Uh, I actually think it's real world experiences being captured in a digital way. And we've been moving towards that um, as a, a society for a very long time. Um, but before we go any further, who the hell are these people in Generation X and why have they ruined everything? Uh, Generation X followed traditionalists and the baby boomers. Um, I'm part of Generation X. We, we grew up struggling to work out what the internet was and how it might fit into life. I remember the first time I was watching television, terrestrial television, so you couldn't pause, rewind, watch anything on demand. You had to watch the adverts. And I remember the first advert that showed a website link, which was surreal to me, the idea that a company would have a website. And actually, for the older people on, on, the, on the stream today, who remembers Microsoft and Carter? I mean, we talk about the internet being like access to the, the world's information at the touch of a button. Microsoft volume of an encyclopedia on a CD disc. Um, I remember walking into the IT room at school. Um, yep, a room uh, for IT, uh, just a room full of IT, and, and opening the CD case and popping it into the tray, and the tray automatically uh, putting the CD into the, uh, into the PC without any of my help. My first search of this volume of the encyclopedia was, was of, of course, dinosaurs. I love dinosaurs. Who remembers MySpace? Some of you might remember MySpace. It was a drag and drop. Uh, a web page builder. There was Friendster, uh, arguably the first social media platform, the first organization to coin the phrase media, um, and phones without keyboards. I mean, nonsense. It'll never work, they said. Um, meanwhile, while all this was going on, uh, charities, um, as everybody was beginning to trust the internet with card details, we witnessed the explosive growth in raising money online while doing awesome things for charity. Um, and I should say, shout out for Just Giving, for creating the online version of the sponsorship form and raising billions worldwide since. Um, charities created awesome moments for supporters and made them feel part of something bigger, whether that's taking part in a big bike ride like I did when I had the idea for Give Penny originally, um, or going for a run, uh, or preparing to go for a, a marathon run and, and putting months of training behind it. Now, or I should say pre-COVID, things moved on a little. It, it's getting harder and was getting harder anyway to sell places at third party events, as people have found more fun things to do in their spare time, whether it's tracking steps um, or, or, or streaming video games. Um, everyday happenings, things that we enjoy doing every day are being tracked and broadcast everywhere. Um, I've raised loads of money um, uh, for different causes, doing different things on GivePenny. Um, when we first launched in 2016, um, the first charity on our platform was the Little Princess Trust, who um, whose main service was to provide real hair wigs for children going through cancer treatment who were losing their hair as a result. Um, I did a million step challenge. So I connected my Fitbit to, um, to my fundraising page on GivePenny. I asked my friends and family. It was the first ever fundraising challenge on GivePenny. So even my friends and family were like, what's this? What, what is this thing? And they sponsored me per step. They said, I'll give you a pound every 10,000 steps or I'll give you 20 pounds when you reach a million steps and also giving one-off donations throughout the challenge as well. Um, and I was one of these people that uh, 
who had a Fitbit in the early days, um, and back in the day when uh, Christmas Day, the number one um, app um, download was was the Fitbit app. Um, and I uh, was watching Game of Thrones. I think it was, might have been season four, maybe. I can't remember which season. If you know, put it in the chat. So um, 2016, what season were we on in Game of Thrones? Um, getting up and walking in the living room at like nine o'clock at night because I'm only 500 steps off 10,000. I'm one of those people. But knowing that every single step was earning money for my favorite charity um, uh, held, held a lot in my heart and I, I wanted to replicate that bottle it up and create a product that other people would would have the same experience um, using so while we're on the subject who the hell are generation Z and how the hell have they ruined everything uh, um, generation Z adults now like now um, I know so many people um, in the charity sector and the commercial sector that still think that generation Z are all children and it's just it's, it's a, a misconception, it's um, uh, a laziness of thought. Um, Generation Z had no idea, um, have no idea what life was like without Snapchat, um, Instagram stories, let alone unprecedented access to the world information using something called the World Wide Web. Um, globally aware, insanely generous with both money and time, incredible multitaskers and have absolutely no idea what people like I mean when I say things like work-life balance. My friend's um, daughter, she's uh, just turned 18. Um, she can be streaming Netflix, laptop open doing some homework while on a permanent FaceTime call with her mates. That's, that's the new normal. I mean, my daughter, she's, she's 10 years old and during lockdown, earlier than we probably would have done as parents, we've given her access to a smartphone and so she can stay in touch with her friends. And I'm already seeing multi-screen kind of interactions all the time. And, and that's part of what we, you know, will coin as the new normal. Um, but at the same time, Generation Z are also super conscious um, of the time they spend being connected and uh, there's a there's a movement towards actively disconnecting, which is good news. And the real world still wins over the idea of of living online. And proof of that is the fact that um, in recent surveys, most most young people take intentional breaks away from technology. Um, the future um, for for all of this is is definitely not going to be lived out on the likes of Facebook and Twitter, and then submitting to the AI drones and, and submitting to a, a robot dictator. Um, by the way, if you haven't seen The Matrix, it's a really good classic. Uh, <laughs> um, I really do think that the future um, won't look um, like a bunch of people staring at their phones constantly. I don't know about you, but I, I, every now and again, I have to double take it. You know, I do miss the pub and this weekend there might be some return to to how that might feel but you can be in conversation with one person from within a group of friends and you're sat around but like over half of you have your faces in your phone and I'm one of those people as well I don't think that the future um, for, for, for society and again and how this relates to, to fundraising involves us staring at devices um, one second by the way, if there's any questions, Josh, just fire them. I do like to be interrupted. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I um, I will when they come your way. There's none in the chat as of yet. But guys, if you do have any questions as we're going, just please put them in the Q&A box and we'll uh, go from there. So I do think that um, part of the future will be that people are snapping, gramming, streaming things. and pre-COVID, I expected that there would be a movement um, towards continuous documentation of, of the world around us, whether that be for personal use or whether that be about feeding the machine that, that might be a social media platform. Um, I would say that um, there's a good case to, to suggest that the coronavirus pandemic and the lockdown conditions it's created have sped up the process. Um, but I, I also think that that might be about adoption of those behaviors by older generations. So 
I'm, a, I'm an early adopter. I'm, I like to pull things apart. I like to try new things. And that's not going to change even as I go through my 40s, 50s, 60s. And, you know, I'm hoping to be a really cool granddad one day with rocket boots and a hoverboard. But um, many people I know um, around my age, for the first time, have encountered video calling and, and streaming and even playing video games and live streaming that and watching other people do stuff and, and, and live quizzes and, and, and whatever it's going to be. Um, so I think that um, further wider adoption of technology um, has given the impression that um, Snap, Gram and Stream um, uh, it has been a real growth factor during lockdown. But you can't deny that we're spending more time online than we have um, pre-COVID. Um, and I would say that everybody's becoming a better content creator. Um, you've got a situation where the quality of a video produced by someone literally from their bedroom um, can hold its own against some of the um, content produced by multi-billion dollar corporations. Um, right at the beginning of, uh, of, of, of lockdown, um, our response at GivePenny, um, at humble old GivePenny, was that um, we would create a, uh, a playlist for the nation to listen to, to lift their mood. It was about a few weeks into lockdown and I think everybody was feeling the pinch a little bit of not being able to see loved ones or, or even go shopping or any of that kind of stuff. And so we created the nation's playlist. Um, I was invited to go on Sky News. I was interviewed in the morning. But to think that the, uh, the camera um, used to create that kind of content for Sky News is the same camera that I'm using for today's session, um, which is a little old FaceTime camera and a MacBook. Um, and the quality of content that we're seeing from people who are podcasting and then also filming it to then upload to things like YouTube, um, the quality of content creation has gone through the roof. So for charities, organizations in the, in the outside of the charity sector, everybody, every organization, there's a real opportunity to harness that. And I think that's gonna be part of the, uh, um, the, the future of fundraising. And what will happen um, when charities um, learn to embrace the idea that their supporters are incredible content creators? What will happen when charities give them permission to use those skills to do stuff that helps them raise money? Um, the fundraisers and supporters will fall in love with those charities and it will create brand loyalty. And you'll, you'll finally begin to look back in years to come and go the first time that this supporter engaged with us as a charity was when they were 19 years old. They did their first ever charitable giving exercise. They live streamed playing The Last of Us Part Two for 24 hours and, and raised a thousand pounds for us. Um, and then they've um, gone on to help fundraise uh, as part of a virtual marathon event. Um, five years later, they engaged the company that they worked for um, and got the entire organization to uh, undertake a massive steps challenge. Um, they had music sponsored by friends and family that raised money for adding tracks to a playlist. They then took on their first real world marathon and they did the London Marathon and then they did an Ironman and they raised £10,000 and then in their 50s they became a regular giver and at the end they left the legacy in their will. That's the holy grail journey for any charity and what they want a supporter to be um, for them. So. Uh, right now is an opportunity for charities to engage with a huge audience because the thing about 2020, given the age range, given the, the fact that we still bless them, we've got traditionalists, we've got baby boomers, we've got Generation X and millennials, and we've got Generation Y and Generation Z, and they're all adults, the audience, the potential audience of supporters and loyal brand lovers has never been this big. But 2020 has been a little bit of a challenge so far. And I don't know if anybody's noticed, but it hasn't been very easy. However, disruption creates conditions in a market for creativity. And charities have come out and created amazing things individuals in the public have created amazing things that have attempted to help prop up the charity sector and the wonderful services that they provide in addition to what 
governmental organizations do on a daily basis. I'm talking about things like the NHS here. Um, brands have come together to create different things. And then we've got people like Captain Tom, who, bless him, walked up and down his garden, inspired the nation to do something, right as 2.6 Challenge was released by London Marathon and all the other fundraising partners. We had Run for Heroes, which I think raised three million quid. Um, big night in where we all just sat in and suddenly thought, well, this might be TV for the future. Everybody stood kind of awkwardly far apart, but at least we're able to have a laugh while we're here. And, and musicians collaborating and, and producing a song whilst being isolated. Um, our effort with the, the, the nation's playlist, trying to get everybody bumped up and in the mood for about how things are going. And we saw that a disruption to the entire sector, the mass cancellation of mass participation events and all of that forecast fundraising revenue disappearing created the conditions for creativity and innovation. And that's been something that's so heartening to see. So what will this mean for the future of fundraising? You can come to your own conclusion, but I firmly believe that the reaction we've seen over the past few months um, in virtual event adoption, and I'm talking about charities that launch things like a, a virtual marathon um, or a gaming challenge or um, uh, Feb, February is a great example, you know, uh, rowing in, on a rowing machine instead of in a boat and then trying to complete as many meters as possible virtually, um, steps challenges, and everything in between, I think has a part to play in the future of fundraising. However, like I said right at the beginning, I still think the future of fundraising are world experiences that are captured digitally. So this isn't about us, you know, getting chips embedded in our skin and automatically giving every time we buy a coffee. Um, this is about being consciously aware of what we're doing in the world, but having to track it and happening to broadcast it to our friends and family to help encourage people to, to, to give to charities we're, we're passionate about. We love this sector, we're lucky in this country. We're one of the most generous countries in Northern Europe. And I think, you know, the UK Giving Index, which is um, produced by the Charities Aid Foundation, their report for next year will be very interesting um, to see what the reaction of the public has been. Um, but yeah, I do think capturing real, real world experiences in a digital fashion um, is the future of, of fundraising. Um, Lee, sorry, just to interrupt you for a second. We've had a couple of questions come through um, on all of the points that you've raised. That's um, hundreds of questions. How can we, can we, that's a lot of questions on all of the points, Josh. Um, oh, well, maybe not all of the points, but. Is it three questions? Is yeah, it three? It's three questions. So. Okay. <laughs> the, sorry, Josh. No, no, don't worry. It's fine. Um, Oh, the first one is from Charlotte um, Walton, um, who, Hi, has, Charlotte. who has asked, I used to use social media to promote events before lockdown, but it wasn't generating interest. How would you suggest getting more engagement? Talking to people. I think one of the, I had a weird thing happen to me today. Uh, sorry, that is a very blunt answer. I'll explain what I mean. I had a weird <laughs> thing happen to me today. Um, I was meant to have a video call, a Teams call with, uh, with one of our charity partners. And uh, she rang, it was very strange. I had, a bit, I had a phone call and a chat and it felt much less, um, much less organized and formal. And I remember what it was like to talk to people again <laughs> without the need to think, well, you know, by looking in the camera am i technically giving eye contact and um what am i wearing today and do my hands look five times bigger than they should be um all that kind of stuff um i would say that charlotte the still the most effective way of engaging people in um in whatever it is you're asking them to to, to engage in it doesn't have to be fundraising it can be oh i thought you should read this article or i noticed this today chat to your friends and family social media you used to be what you shared appeared in chronological order um, to the friends you were connected with, whether that was on Facebook or, um, or Twitter. Um, but things have changed now. And to get what you have seen requires an awful, awful lot more work, even on a personal level. Forget a business to business level or a business to consumer level. And so I would say 
remember that where you're sharing your content is on rented land. So if, if it's on Facebook, that's Facebook's land and they decide who sees what. So I would say, try to use direct messaging, um, the good old SMS text message, as well as things like WhatsApp. Yes, I know it's owned by Facebook, but at least you can see who's read what you've sent them um, and talk to people. I, I still believe that part of the, the lost, um, maybe not lost, part of the attention that has reduced from having all these convenient online sharing tools is the awareness of what a cause is doing and how they will use the money that's being raised. So if you take Cancer Research's Marathon Month Challenge, the whole thing is about taking on a marathon in a month and, and, and trying to complete it. Some people are doing like four marathons in a month and that's fantastic. But um, my wife did, um, did the challenge and listening her talk to her friends on the phone about it and about the fact that cancer's touched our lives in, in, in ways that mean that we're quite passionate about the cause, that's always gonna lead to more engagement and also more awareness of the, of the actual fight that the, that the charity has on their hands, especially now, because not only do they have the fight of um, reducing instances of cancer and, and, and funding millions of pounds worth of re, um, research, they now have it on, on the backdrop of losing funding and losing all of the money normally raised through mass participation events. So the art of conversation would be my um, long, longer version answer of that. So I hope that helps. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for that, Lee. Um, the next question was from Chris. Um, and he simply asked, how important is consistency and regularity in terms of content release? I missed the end of the question there. Sorry, Josh. Say again. Uh, no worries. How important is consistency and regularity in terms of content release? Consistency and regularity. So in terms of brand consistency, very important. You need to be on brand. And uh, that can come with some challenges if you have a very well-known brand and that brand is known for being a particular way if you suddenly want to go from asking people to do bake sales to suddenly asking them to stream Fortnite and raise money you do have to wonder how that tone of voice um, marries up um, but yeah being being consistent and on brand is still important um, but to stand out you have to do things that create noise. It's a very noisy world online at the moment. And, you know, have we, has anybody had a day yet in the last few months where they haven't said the word coronavirus, COVID-19 or lockdown? <laughs> We're all talking about the same thing. We're all talking about it a lot. So to cut through that noise, you do have to do things that stand out, but there is a level of consistency from a brand point of view that I think charities absolutely um, need to maintain. Um, I mean, if you look on, on the slide that's up there at the moment, um, Help for Heroes have, are rightfully, they fight very hard to ensure that they've got consistency across their brand. Um, and everything they produce um, uh, nods to that. The value is in their brand. They're not, they're not the biggest charity. People assume there's to be a huge charity. They're a very well-known brand. They have a consistency of message that I think works really well. But they're able enough with that with that brand um, to go into gaming and at the same same regard um, talk about the kind of services that they provide and the support they do for society so yeah con consistency is key but you've got to do something to stand out and you can't be afraid to to do something that stands out yeah okay interesting um Hopefully and that helps. <laughs> <laughs> um and the other question that we had was from Eleanor Garten, who was just interested to know how much the nation's playlist um, has raised so far. So um, in the amount of exposure that we have, I mean, we're a, we're a modest organization um, and at the time. Um, we hadn't um, experienced any of the, the changes that I'll go on to, to talk to you guys about in terms of our journey through the coronavirus. So we didn't pump a load of marketing money behind what we did. And we were lucky enough to be spotted by Sky News. But in a matter of four hours, we raised three and a half grand, and that was purely from song choices. So we had people, you could donate as little as 50 pence to add a song to the Nations Playlist. And actually, if you go on Spotify, it's still there. If you go to the nationsplaylist.com, um, you'll find the playlist there. And um, it raised three and a half grand. It had millions of eyes um, on Cancer Research UK at a time where 
really it felt like the country's only charity in mind was NHS charities together. Now, there had to be a watershed moment in the national conversation where everybody realised that it's not just about the NHS charities together um, uh, movement, but the entire charity sector. You know, there's 100, 185,000 registered charities in the UK, and every single one of them, literally overnight, suddenly had the same problem. And rightfully, everybody was um, talking about the NHS. Um, we were clapping on Thursday nights and, you know, and, and it, the attention was rightfully there, but there had to be a moment where um, the, the, the country realized that charities needed our help. And I think the nation's playlist played its part. Um, and for, you know, being on Kay Burley's breakfast show, never been that nervous in my life ever. And I'm stood in my kid's playroom <laughs> having a chat. Um, you're talking about four and a half million eyeballs. Um, so I think it was good for the exposure and, and part of the conversation for getting the idea that charities needed our help, not just the NHS, given how amazing they were. Um, charities all are all in, in, in all areas of, of, of um, supporting society needed our help around that time. So yeah, proud of that. But yeah, about, about three and a half grand so far. And the intention is to, uh, um, to continually re-release the nation's playlist. Um, either in aid of other charities or with different themes in mind and working with um, celebrities and influencers on that at the same time. So something that we know connects everybody is music. So yeah, that's why we did it that way. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much um, for answering those questions. Lee. We do have a few more, but I'll try and save some for the end because I'm just conscious about eating into your actual um, presentation time. Okay, I'm winging it anyway. We always do. <laughs> We're all winging it at the moment, aren't we, right? Um, so yeah, um, uh, I, I was going to talk about the, the, the story, not just for us, but I think we, we have a, um, a story based on the effects of the lockdown and, and the coronavirus on, on society and what that meant for, for, for people surrounding the charity sector, suppliers, partners, um, fundraising platforms, everybody, events companies, everybody. Um, so it's the 23rd um, or around then that, that lockdown was announced and we all kind of knew something was coming and there were still people going, they'll never close the school. Why, how would that work? I can't see how that's going to work. Um, bang, there you go. Overnight. Schools are closed and if you can work from home, you should. You shouldn't leave the house and all that stuff. And we're sat there thinking online fundraising has to play its part here. So let's get in touch with all of our current partners and see if we can help them. So we, 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 we were already set up to work remotely and luckily that meant that there wasn't much ramp up time for us and learning how, how to, to make either your personal laptop work for work or whatever, we were already in that position and we were able to quickly get in touch with the, the charity partners we already had on board and talk to them about how to um, rapidly deploy virtual events, online challenges, creative donation appeals and all of that kind of stuff. Um, two days later, um, as an offhand comment somewhere on, on, uh, on Facebook, um, I mentioned, would anybody like to know how to spin up a virtual event in under an hour? Because that's effectively what um, one of the main um, core functions of GivePenny is. And we had 400 registrations for a webinar. And to put that into context from a, a business to business point of view, because we are an organization, a, a business um, that has charities for customers, if you run a webinar, um, educational or otherwise, if you have 20 people attend, that's a success. I mean, today, what do we have? About 80 people, Josh? Um, that's incredible. Um, Pre-COVID, if you had you know, 20, 30 people, that, that would be an incredible... And, and then if half of them actually turn up and engage with you, that in itself would be successful. So for us, we were inundated, absolutely inundated. Every single person who registered turned up to the webinar. Again, didn't expect that. We went through how to spin up a, a virtual event from concept all the way through to like configuring the, the platform and releasing something. And what that led to was uh, a barrage <laughs> in a positive way uh, of charities using GivePenny to ask their supporters to support them during these difficult times. It was also around the time that we were learning that, you know, the likes of the London Marathon were in doubt and that um, football wasn't going to be happening and and all this kind of stuff um, and so uh, during that time 
you know, quite proud of the idea that, that, that the team here at Give Penny um, were able to step up and, and, and help so many charities, big and small, swiftly launch things that help them raise money when they needed it most. Um, and what that's meant for us is that we've then gone on to speed up engagements we already had with existing partners, with the likes of Help for Heroes and St John Ambulance and Cancer Research UK, and get ideas out there to their supporters um, to help them replace, uh, and it is a small proportion of the loss that they normally would have raised as a result of all of these events and physical gatherings and coffee mornings and everything else in between being cancelled. Um, so yeah, it's, it's forced everybody to think more like Generation Z. And I think that one of the fundamental things that I love about um, being a glass half full person is that you can always get through it. You can always find a way. And I think the way out of, out of all of this, when we learn to, to, um, to work in slightly different conditions, maybe temporarily, but I do think there'll be some permanent um, relics that we see in society as a result of this, this lockdown, um, behaving more like Generation Z, um, swiftly changing things, pivoting, being in a perpetual state of revolution, always um, not afraid to, to challenge the status quo, um, I think would be the right kind of behavior for, for charities and, and people looking to raise money for charity um, uh, to engage people that, you know, friends and family to, to donate. Um, so yeah, I think people should be more Z basically. And uh, that's it. So yeah, thanks very much for listening so far today. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you so much Lee. Um, I'm sure everybody got a lot of um, value from that session. Um, we do have questions coming through, so I'll just read them out to you in um, chronological order. Um, so Rosie um, Hunnam of Organised Fun, um, she asks or has stated that students are often at the forefront of innovation and creativity. What tips do you have for student leaders and particularly student fundraisers about where to start putting their energy for fundraising? Where can they start leading the way when they start back at university and college in autumn? It'll be about your, your, your tribe. So first and foremost, surround yourself with people that say yes. Don't, don't think you should do it on your own. Don't try to do it on your own. I mean, goodness knows, I, I know when it comes to getting ideas off the ground and leading people and trying to create a movement, um, you can't do it on your own. So talk to people. Um, if you're returning to university, talk to your close friends. If it's the first time that you're going to university, I mean, I feel for you because this will be the weirdest experience. Um, although you won't know the difference because you don't know what it was like before. So you might be all right, but find yourself uh, a tribe of people that will support you. And they've got to be yes people. People who tell you that something won't work um, without then offering any alternative solution or feedback um, uh, aren't going to be helpful. So my advice would be for anybody returning, um, um, don't, don't give up. Uh, I think it's Dyson. There's, there's a couple of pieces of advice that I, I've had before. Um, Dyson says, go where others aren't. So, I mean, he, he went with vacuum cleaners. <laughs> His first invention was actually a wheelbarrow that had a ball instead of a wheel. But the problem is, how many wheelbarrows do you buy in your lifetime? Probably one. So there's not really much of a market for another wheelbarrow after you've sold another. So then he went to vacuums and we all know the story of Dyson since then. Um, so go where people aren't. Um, but that said, with the charity sector and with fundraising in general, there's nothing wrong with um, giving people the whisper of familiar. So um, if you see something that's successful, it could be a virtual marathon, the nation's playlist, it could be anything. Um, there's no harm in using that as the um, underlying blueprint for, a, for an idea and, and uh, copying, <laughs> copying what's out there already. Because if it worked before, um, your job's then to work out how it might work again, how you might move it on from, 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 uh, from its original state. So surround yourself with the right people, go where others aren't, um, and, uh, and don't be afraid to, to, to nick ideas, basically. <laughs> Wonderful. 
Um, so Sam Arnold from Nottingham Trent Students Union um, asks, what do you see as the future for mass particip participation events such as the London Marathon? I think that the lasting effect of this will be that we realise that um, at one end of the scale, like I said earlier, the, the early part of this, this lockdown, people have said, look, we don't need offices. <laughs> we can all work from home. Um, I'd ask that person how they feel about working from home after they've done it for a year. Uh, I think the idea of physically meeting hasn't gone. The idea that people want to run something like the London Marathon will still be attractive, although it was getting harder and harder for charities to um, assign places to third party events. What might be a result of this lockdown will be a, a new appreciation for the privilege there is um, in running something like the London Marathon. There are uh, so many other events, you know, hospices have their own 10Ks and I would urge you all to look at those as well as the major mass participation events. Um, but yeah, I, I think the future um, will be that there will be an appetite, first of all, and there might be a, either a temporary or a permanent um, resurgence in um, popularity in taking part in mass participation events when they're allowed. Um, but I also think the long lasting effect of lockdown will be that all of these virtual events have opened the eyes of charities into what's possible in terms of giving fundraisers an engaging journey, an engaging experience, more than I'm doing the London Marathon in six months, will you sponsor me? Which is effectively saying, give me some money because I'm going to do this in the future. That's worked and worked really well for years. Um, but I think that given that we can say, I'm intending on running the London Marathon and I'm going to track all my running in my training on Strava, you can see that I'm going running. Here's the route that I did yesterday. Will you sponsor me for my next 20 miles? And then I go out running on a rainy Sunday and I know that the hill I've got to get up was going to raise another 15 quid. I think that that type of digital experience bolted onto the crescendo that is crossing the finishing line at the London Marathon will be the new type of mass participation experience. It'll be a longer, more engaging, more enriching experience for supporters if charities recognize the power of allowing a content creator to do what they do in the lead up to the thing they really want to do. Because what we don't see is the original story behind, behind GivePenny. I trained for a 100 mile bike ride and uh, bear in mind, I hadn't cycled longer than, than 20 minutes. Um, and I decided I'm going to do the equivalent of a marathon on a bike. So I buy a better bike, like most people think that they need to do. It's nothing to do with the bike. It's all about the training. I go out, train through in the winter months. I attack hills. I become a sadist. I become one of those guys that's like, oh, I'm going to go and do that hill today because it will really hurt. Um, and then a week, two weeks before the, uh, the big race, I did 75 miles. I had never ridden that far. I'd eaten a ton of Haribo. I was sugar buzzing. It was brilliant, brilliant. Got home, so proud of myself. And the idea was you then taper off training. You have a, effectively a week and a half of recovery and rest, ready for the big day. What I'd done is I'd battered my immune system and I caught a cold. Uh, it actually turned out to be flu. I couldn't get out of bed on the day of the race and I couldn't do the 100 mile bike ride. I'd raised about 200 quid on Just Giving and um, I'd done that within the first day of deciding I was going to do a 100 mile bike ride months later. I felt so guilty because I hadn't done the 100 mile bike ride. But then I thought I got frustrated because I tracked over a thousand miles of training. No one knew. It was back in the days when Strava wasn't really a social platform for athletes. It was literally a you know, cycling tracker. Um, and I thought, well, that's the real experience for the fundraiser. All of that training, yes, I'm trying to get to this point where I'm going to do a 100 mile bike ride and that'll feel amazing. But I know I was, I was doing it for Prostate Cancer UK and that 200 pounds means a lot to them. And, and none of my friends realise that that's what I've been through. So I think the future for mass participation events has to recognise the entire journey because there's so much meaning in it. And I think we've now got some of the tools that allow us to do it. I mean, imagine, you know, live streaming part of your training, keeping a keeping a vlog on YouTube that keeps people up to date, having that video embedded on your fundraising page so people come back to see the latest episode of your update. You know, this week's podcast where I'm talking about how my training's going. Here's all my Strava miles. You can sponsor me for a mile, add songs to my playlist as I'm training. And then on the day itself, I bet you everybody who sponsored you in those months leading up to it 
will do what they do every time you you know someone does something like the london marathon they'll sponsor you on the day as well so yeah i think the future of the event is a is a longer experience but it absolutely has to have digital in there in enriching what's going on amazing um so the next question we have again is from charlotte um she asked have you got any tips that would help us to create a bigger social media presence? Wow. Whoa, whoa. Um, depends on the platform. So if it's Facebook and Twitter, you know, the big monolithic, you know, the, the, what we think are the original social media platforms, but the big ones, it's very difficult to grow a social media following without money. Um, but if you're going to do it organically, I do think it starts with talking to people. Again, you've got a network yourself that you don't realize how big it is. And um, social media aside, is it, is it we're all seven degrees away from Kevin Bacon? I don't know. <laughs> but the idea is that your network is bigger than you think it is. Um, I also think that growing a social media following has to who you want to follow you and why. So why you want them to follow you um, perhaps isn't as important as why they should follow you in the first place. What do they get from, from you? Um, if, if any of you have seen Innocent Drinks on Twitter, I think there is a masterclass in how to grow a social following. Um, and it's effectively make people laugh uh, with, with lots of random jokes and, and what have you and, and create conversations because that's what Twitter is for, live conversations. Um, other people to aspire to, to might be uh, BrewDog. Um, so BrewDog's social media presence is you know, absolutely on brand for them and, and the content they produce gets shared and liked, but it's difficult to, to grow a social following um, without money, without the idea of promoting posts and deploying a good um, A-B testing strategy for what works versus what doesn't. Um, but be mindful of who you're attracting to your presence and why, because the number isn't always the most important thing. It's absolutely about the level of engagement that you get and who's giving you that engagement and the power they have. So I would say, um, don't, don't think that it's about the number and um, realize that it's difficult to do without, without your personal networks. You know, between, if there's a team of you trying to grow, grow a social following, um, if it's a small team, focus on maybe one platform. Don't try and do them all. Um, and, and maybe, yeah, take, take some of Dyson's advice. No harm in going where others aren't. I mean, did any of you hear, is it called Queeby? Josh, I'm going to ask you now. I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you know what Queeby is? Queeby? Queeby? Um, no, I do not, unfortunately. If anybody, if anybody in the chat knows what I'm talking about, it's basically um, high-quality, short-form video content. So you've, you've basically got like an HBO level kind of production for a 10 minute. If you're creating, uh, if you're thinking about creating a, uh, a video based uh, persona online, you might benefit from considering something like, I think it's called Queeby. I hope, it, I hope I'm right there. But looking where others aren't. Um, when, you remember when TikTok, we, nobody knew what TikTok was? that was the time to get in on TikTok and try and grow an audience. So yeah, focus on one, have a clear plan, find people around you, use your own network. Um, I, hope, I hope that helps. There's no silver bullet though. <laughs> no, it's definitely not. Um, <laughs> so we've got two more questions and I'm just conscious of time. These might have to be brief answers, but we'll try and get through them. Okay, um, cool. So one of them is from um, an anonymous an anonymous attendee. Um, they've Ooh. asked, yep, mysterious. Um, they've asked, how do you make a niche cause feel more relatable? You've talked a lot about shared experiences, but how do you do that if it's likely to be limited? Um, I would say that to be to become more relatable, you have to open up. So if you're a niche cause, um, I mean all causes a niche, but I know what you're, you're getting to. You might, you know, you might be a cause that focuses treatment and support for a very rare disease, for example. So, you know, 
it's all about education and, and the services you provide to kind of support people that might be going through for treatment for that kind of thing um, and about awareness and that kind of stuff but if you're if I'm honest the, the way to do it is to is to open up and you know if you're doing it online then you know talking honestly um, um, videos about current working practices showing people the services that are provided making it authentic being, being authentic not making it authentic being authentic um, and not try to be overproduced is probably a better way to endear people um, but if you are a, if you're a niche cause that has that, then the best way to become more relatable is to relate to people. It's have conversations, start conversation. It goes back to what I was saying about growing an audience. Like if you're, if you have a very high quality level of engagement with a small number of, of, of people in your network, I'd argue that's much more powerful um, than having tens of thousands of followers that never like share or even send you a message or, or an email or any of that kind of stuff. So yeah, um, be more relatable. It, it would be about opening up and hopefully, um, hopefully that helps. Yep. Amazing. Um, I'm afraid that is the time for our sessions. So the one question that we do have outstanding, we will take over to the coffee shop. Um, the link for that I've posted in the uh, webinar chat um, on the right hand side. Um, but yeah, Lee, thank you so, so much. That was a, an amazing presentation. Um, and hopefully, um, I'm sure everybody has got a lot of value out of it. Um, and we're all very grateful for you um, coming and talking to us today. Oh, you're welcome. And thanks everybody for, for taking part as well.